and yeah, so I got it. So it's recording now. And before before we start, so I've got uh, um, I've got a few slides, and I've got also a set of uh, Jupyter notebooks uh, that um, basically go through some uh, demonstration code how to access and analyze climate data. So uh, uh, before before I start, I just want to point you all again towards this uh, GitHub repository. So I think Indy sent the uh, the link to this repository earlier uh, today. Uh, and that contains actually both the slides and, and all the, the Jupyter notebooks that we're gonna go through uh, during this, uh, this session. And maybe I'm gonna do something because I'm kind of sitting sideways to my computer and I don't know how to... Uh... So Nicola, if you don't mind, just a few minutes of uh, just saying what you do and yeah, so yeah, I start. about yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I've got I've got a slide for that actually. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to introduce myself quickly. So you, you can all see that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So very briefly, like a short kind of personal introduction. So my name is uh, Nicolas Fauchereau. So you got my name very right indeed, thanks. Uh, so I'm a climate scientist. I'm working at uh, NIWA, the National Institute for Water and Atmospheric Research. And I'm based at the Hamilton office. NIWA has got uh, offices a, a bit uh, spread across the country, including Oakland, uh, Wellington and Christchurch. I'm based in, uh, in the Hamilton office. And my research interests are like broadly speaking, um, scale interactions in the climate system. Okay, I'm gonna move that around. Um, predictability, I'm especially interested into uh, uh, sub-seasonal to seasonal uh, predictability and forecasting. Um, I'm using uh, machine learning to do that uh, notably. And recently I've been uh, become interested in to uh, complex networks in the context of um, uh, climate data mining and uh, uncovering relationships in the, in the climate system. And I've been a Python user, user since the early 2000s, so that's been quite a while already. Uh, and um, uh, I've, since, uh, since the start, I've been quite an advocate for Python for climate data analysis and visualization. I've, and I've actually run um, a couple of workshops um, in-house, so at NIWA, but also outside of NIWA on uh, using Python for climate data analysis and visualization. So <clears throat> this workshop is gonna be quite informal, I hope, or at least that's, that's, uh, that's how I want it to be. So you're Welcome to interrupt me at any point uh, when I, especially when I go through the through the examples, and you're also welcome to uh, contact me after this workshop. Um, I'm always up my, my um, I'm always open for discussions around you know Python for data analysis, visualization, machine learning, etc. And also, if you've got you know questions or comments on 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 the content of this particular workshop, I've got some kind of a blog. Uh, I've um, uh, uh, put the link to this blog here, but I'm, I'm posting very infrequently and that's all about uh, basically some, some Python um, code uh, to, uh, to do some uh, data analysis and visualization of, uh, especially of climate data. Uh, so uh, very briefly how this workshop is structured. So again, that's very, uh, uh, try to keep it very informal. Uh, what I'm gonna start is that I'm gonna give you a, a very kind of high level of our view of the, the types of climate data that are out there that you can access. So freely uh, available climate data and um, point you to towards um, useful resources uh, about how to uh, find, discover and access uh, different types of climate data. Then I'll give you a very, very brief introduction on uh, Python and the Python scientific ecosystem. Uh, so obviously we've got only two hours. So uh, 
it's you're not going to learn to code. So I don't know exactly what your background is. If you've got uh, uh, a lot of background in um, uh, scientific programming or not, but obviously uh, in two hours I cannot. Um, uh, it's not going to be able to teach you how to code. And really, uh, the goal of this workshop is more to give you an overview of what climate data is out there, um, how uh, you can use Python to access and analyze this, uh, this data. Um, and, and really, uh, it's kind of like a show and tell, like a, a demonstration of what you can do uh, with uh, a subset of, uh, of the scientific uh, packages that are available uh, in the Python world. Um, and then I'm, I'm going to give you a very, again, very quick overview of um, uh, Jupyter Notebooks and Jupyter Lab. So that's the uh, um, programming environment that I'm using. Uh, and uh, that's also very popular uh, to share code uh, results and analysis. Um, and a lot of people are using uh, Jupyter Notebooks and um, Jupyter Lab uh, to, uh, to develop and share their code. Uh, and then there's, uh, we're going to delve a bit more into the demos, demonstration part of the workshop. And uh, there's, there are two libraries in particular that I'm going to spend a bit more time on. Uh, one is Pandas and the other one is XRA. And I'll explain a bit uh, why I focus on those two libraries or package, uh, packages. Uh, and uh, what we're going to do with those libraries or packages is uh, notably access and analyze some reanalysis data. So I'm, I'm going to say a few words about what, uh, what I mean by reanalysis data. Um, but in brief, um, that allows you to look back at the past, basically. Um, and uh, we are going to also see how to access and analyze the latest iteration of uh, the climate model in intercomparison project, CMIP6, uh, which is the set of uh, climate model simulations that basically has informed the latest IPCC working group one um, report uh, that was released a couple of months ago. So those are climate change uh, simulations. Uh, so very briefly, uh, again very high level of our view of the, the types of the kind of categories of climate data that's out there. Uh, the first one are in situ observations, so they are actual measurements uh, taken at a specific location in space or in space and time uh, um, over the earth. They are climate proxies which are uh, basically natural archives that uh, record some uh, properties of uh, the atmosphere or the ocean, such as temperature, um, uh, salinity, uh, precipitation, rainfall, or rain, uh, and rainfall sources, etc. Uh, so those proxies allow uh, climate scientists to go back uh, beyond um, the, the time where we actual where we have actual measurements. So uh, we can use climate proxies to uh, go back several thousand years and in some cases several million years in the past to try and reconstruct uh, the climates of the past. And then there's um, uh, a whole lot of data coming from uh, satellite platforms so satellite remote sensing data. Uh, so those satellites can measure a whole range of properties of the atmosphere and the ocean, uh, including temperature, precipitation, uh, wind speed, uh, and, and a whole bunch of um, uh, climate-related environmental uh, indicators, such as uh, uh, chlorophyll activity, etc., etc. And then there's um, simulations. So, uh, and broadly speaking, you can uh, uh, divide that into three main categories. There's all the weather to decadal, decadal forecasts. So basically, these this are all data coming from uh, numerical models that um, simulates the climate uh, or the atmosphere and that can give you a heads up um, uh, over the next um, 
let's say one day to five days. So those are weather forecasts. Sub-seasonal forecasts go beyond the weather time scale up to let's say 30 days. And then you've got seasonal climate forecasts that uh, cover the period, let's say one month to six months, or sometimes nine months in the future. And there's also relatively recently emerging decadal climate forecast that gives you an, an idea of uh, the evolution of the climate system over uh, several years in the future. And then there are reanalysis. So um, that's one of the climate data sources that we're going to focus on and um, climate model simulation. So I'm going to actually explain a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, so in terms of in-situ observation, so again, those are uh, measurements uh, uh, made by captors or sensors um, that are either fixed in space and time or uh, that are not fixed in space and time. And um, they include a whole range of types of uh, observations. So they are weather and climate stations, uh, though in, in some cases, those climate stations are um, uh, basically standardized by the World Meteorolo Meteorological Organization. That means that the measurements are done um, uh, following some uh, very specific uh, requirements in terms of the environment of the captors or the sensor, etc. cetera. Uh, there's also uh, recently, over the past couple of decades, the uh, development of low-cost sensors that can be deployed in the built or um, natural environment. Uh, buoys, either fixed, so moored buoys or drifting weather buoys. There's also the Argo array that actually measures properties uh, uh, at depth in the ocean ships of opportunity, aircraft, radio sounds, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, generally speaking, those in-situ observations come in a variety of formats. Um, and uh, in most cases, they, are, they come in text format uh, with uh, either CSV, tab delimited, et cetera. And I've included in, the, in this slide, a few resources. Uh, so if you're interested in uh, actual in situ observations, especially uh, weather or climate station data, um, that's where you can find uh, some of this data. Uh, and uh, uh, specifically for New Zealand, and actually we're going to see an example of uh, that, you can find uh, daily uh, temperature and daily rainfall data on the Ministry for the Environment website. Uh, so you have to register, but the data itself is, uh, is free. And we're actually going to use the daily temperature um, from this website, download it from this website in one of the, one of the examples. So again, that's, all that is freely available data. In some cases, you have to register, but you don't have to pay to get the data. And then there's um, atmospheric reanalysis. So in short, um, atmospheric reanalysis are data assimilation projects. So um, what re a reanalysis system does is that it uses a numerical weather model, so a numerical model, uh, and, that, and it ingests past historical and also real time in some instances observations and it produces physically, so dynamically consistent fields of multiple variables over multiple levels in the atmosphere. There's, there are also ocean reanalysis that do the same for, uh, for the ocean. And the uh, main interest in, uh, of those reanalysis data is that it's gridded. So it covers the whole globe on a regular latitude longitude grid. Uh, it covers for some variables, uh, different levels. Uh, and basically it allows you to do things like specialization, regionalization, extract um, uh, specific regions uh, using shape files, etc. And it's really, really widely used uh, in climate si science because again, those reanalysis systems provide you with uh, complete 
so spatially and temporally, and uh, dynamically consistent uh, fields of uh, a lot of um, climate variables, such as temperature, or precipitation, geopotential, um, uh, uh, radiation, etc., etc. And generally, the outputs of uh, those various reanalysis systems are available in NetCDF. So NetCDF stands for Network, Network Common Data Form, and it's a very widely used uh, format to uh, basically store uh, those kind of graded uh, climate data. So NetCDF is a binary file format. Uh, but it's self-described. So in other words, uh, in the file itself, in self, you've got all the information that um, allows you to understand how the data varies along various dimensions. Let's, let's again, for example, latitude, longitude, levels in the atmosphere, etc. So that's basically a self-contained um, uh, binary format, which, uh, which includes the data itself but also the metadata uh, that, uh, that tells you how the, um, the data varies along uh, given dimensions. <clears throat> so one, um, so some resources that I've included in this slide. Uh, so a very good place to start when, you've, when you're looking for climate data is the uh, climate data guide by, the, uh, by UCA. Uh, so if you go, so I'm going to open it in a browser. Uh, and you've got um, basically uh, a search engine that allows you to search for any kind of data, uh, either by uh, variable type or by, um, by type of products, station data, gridded data, satellite data, etc. So. Again, a very good place to start is the UK uh, and Climate Data Guide. Uh, so for the, there's also the Climate Tree Analyzer. So I'm just gonna open it also in a separate tab. Um, so you cannot really access the data itself, but you can really very quickly produce some uh, really nice visualizations um, uh, using a variety of, uh, of data sets, including uh, reanalysis data sets. Uh, so I'm gonna go back to the slides. Um, and there's uh, really a variety of reanalysis systems that have been developed and run over the years. And the, the two ones that we're gonna focus on are uh, the NCEP NCAR reanalysis. Um, which goes back to 1948, actually not 1950. Um, so that's kind of like the, the earliest generation of uh, reanalysis. And that's been used in literally thousands of, uh, of uh, climate studies. Uh, um, a more recent iteration of uh, NCEP, so NCEP stands for the National Center for Environmental Prediction. That's a, that's a US institution, is the NCEP Department of Energy Reanalysis, or, or NCEP2, uh, which covers the period 1979 to, uh, to north. So that's also um, uh, quite a nice and convenient um, source of reanalysis data. And the other one that we're gonna see, um, well, well, actually, um, actually demonstrate, I'm gonna demonstrate some example is ERA5. So that's um, European reanalysis system. Uh, that covers the period 1979 now, and that's been actually recently extended back to 1950. And now that's basically widely considered as the, the state of the art and the best um, uh, reanalysis data set out there. And the kind of uh, official source for ERA5 reanalysis is uh, the Climate Data Store. So, um, so that's uh, uh, a platform that was developed under the auspices of uh, the Copernicus project. Um, and what you have to do is to register again, but that's for free. And you've got, so if I'm gonna register, I'm gonna, sorry, log in. So the Copernicus data store, you can search. Again, that's a kind of 
integrated platform where you can search for a lot of different data sets. You've got climate indices, climate projections, and here you've got reanalysis. And you will find, um, for example, the ERA5 um, data set on this platform. Uh, and um, so all you have to do is register and uh, there's an API uh, that you have to install. So uh, basically a little Python package uh, and you need to, uh, to uh, basically inform the API to, to give the API your, your credentials in, in order to access the data, but that's completely free. All right. uh, I'm gonna show you um, uh, another way to access uh, ERA5 without actually downloading the data. Uh, in the in the note in the relevant notebook. Okay, so that's for atmospheric reanalysis. So again, the main interest is that it provides you with consistent, complete, gridded data for a variety of uh, climate variables um, uh, over different levels uh, in the atmosphere, and that's really widely used, uh, especially for. Um, the kind of studies that are looking at um, better understanding the past climate viability and teleconnections in the climate system and uh, predictability in the climate system. And then you've got uh, climate change simulations. So again, uh, the ones that we are going to focus on are the semip 6 simulations. So those are the future climate projections that have, uh, that have informed the latest uh, IPCC Working Group 1 uh, report, so the one on the physical basis of climate change. And uh, basically, the SEMIP6 project uh, gathers um, uh, simulations from over 100 distinct uh, climate models uh, run by about 49 different modeling groups under different emission scenarios that are called uh, shared uh, socioeconomic pathways. Uh, so basically, they give you the potential trajectory, trajectories of the climate system under different uh, emission scenarios. And all this data, again, is available for free. Um, you've got... Uh, on this slide, a few resources that are for those who are interested in uh, accessing and better understanding also um, uh, what goes under the hood of uh, SEMIP6, um, especially this, uh, this first link here from Carbon Brief, the Carbon Brief organization is a very good introduction to, uh, to SEMIP6. Uh, so the problem with SEMIP6 is that uh, you've got all those different emission scenarios, all those different general circulation models, those different uh, modeling groups. Uh, there are actually many more types of experiments than the uh, um, shared socioeconomic pathways ones per se. And it makes it very hard to actually find your way around. So uh, the official source for all the SEMIP6 uh, uh, simulations is uh, the Earth System Grid Federation. So I've included the link here. But um, we're lucky enough that um, uh, Google has entered a par partnership with um, the, the PANGEO initiative. I'm going to say a few words about this initiative. And basically made available on the Google Cloud uh, a subset of the SEMIP6 data. So what it means is that um, uh, you can kind of more easily um, search for and access uh, a subset of those SEMIP6 simulation uh, using uh, the Google Cloud platform. And I'm going to show you how to do that uh, from within Python. Uh, so not everything is there. Uh, uh, not, uh, it's not the complete archive of the uh, SEMIP6 simulations. That, I mean, the complete archive is literally dozens and dozens of terabytes. Uh, but if, um, if you are looking for kind of standard products such as uh, the, the standard um, uh, SSPs uh, and the standard um, uh, climate models, you, you will very likely find it on the Google Cloud. And that's much more convenient than 
to have uh, to download the data from the Earth System Grid Federation. Uh, okay. Are there any questions so far? So again, I want to keep it quite informal. So if you've got questions around what I've presented so far, please do interrupt. Okay, so now I'm going to move on uh, to a, a very, again, high level of our view of uh, the Python scientific ecosystem. So Python is a, a general purpose uh, a scripting language and what it means, uh, so scripting language as opposed to compile, uh, in a nutshell means that you've got an interpreter uh, that is running in the background constantly and you can um, type instructions, comments, send it to the interpreter, uh, the interpreter is going to execute those comments and um, give you back the output. And this output can be um, some text or some numbers or uh, some figures, uh, all kind of uh, okay, all kind of things. Um, so the main interest of uh, scripting language, as opposed to a compiled language, is the the interactivity that you can have. So basically, you can have this constant interaction with your data where you load data, you do some manipulations uh, and you get the, uh, the result immediately. You don't have to wait for the program to compile in order to, uh, to have the output. Um, so an example of, of compiled programming language are, for example, C, C++ and, and Fortran. And uh, Python is part of the so-called scripting uh, languages. Uh, which also include things like R, which is a dedicated uh, statistical uh, analysis language. But Python is a general purpose scripting language uh, that was initially designed to be very simple and easy to learn, but yet powerful. And on top of Python, the core language, uh, the scientific communities, so many actually different scientific communities have built uh, a whole bunch of uh, packages that allow you to um, uh, load and analyze variety, a variety of uh, data sets, um, do statistical analysis, do visualizations, um, do machine learning, complex network analysis, uh, image analysis, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the, the popularity of the Python uh, language in the scientific community has uh, really been increasing uh, since uh, since it's released in uh, in the early 1990s, and it's very very widely used, especially in the in the climate and ocean and atmosphere atmospheric sciences. And uh, so this gives you kind of like an overview of of um, the Python scientific ecosystem. Not everything is there, obviously. But that's how you can conceptualize it. You've got uh, Python at the core, so the, the, the core Python scientific la the programming language. Uh, and you've got a set of uh, core um, packages such as NumPy, which provides you with uh, um, some data structures allowing you to hold arrays of, uh, of numbers, matplotlib, uh, which is the foundational library for uh, a lot of um, uh, visualization packages, um, XRA, uh, which provides you with, um, which is built on top of uh, NumPy and actually Dask as well, which provides you with uh, the ability to uh, deal with multi-dimensional labeled arrays. So we're going to see the, the interest of that in the, in the context of climate data. Uh, Jupyter, which is the, basically a development environment and also uh, a file format, the, the notebook, which allows you to uh, basically weave together code, figures, comments, and, uh, and rich outputs. Um, Pandas, which allows you to uh, read from and, and write to a variety of tabular uh, data formats, so CSV, Excel files, etc., etc. And SciPy, which is uh, in a nutshell, again, uh, um, a collection of uh, uh, scientific algorithms, so interpolation, 
uh, curve fitting, uh, statistics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you've got all those different uh, specialized um, domain packages and those uh, domain specific uh, packages that have been built on top. So it's it's kind of you know layers of different uh, different packages that have been built on top of the Python programming language itself. And the ones that we're going to see in particular during this workshop are Pandas, XRA, and Jupyter. Um, so again, the goal of this workshop is not to teach you how to code in Python. It's really more to um, uh, give you some pointers on how to use Python to access and analyze uh, climate data with, again, a focus on reanalysis data and uh, semipsic simulations, or at least the, the subset of semipsic simulations that are available on the cloud. Um, OK, uh, so very briefly, a few words about Pandas and XRA. So those are basically the, the two foundational, foundational libraries that we're going to use uh, during this workshop. Uh, so Pandas uh, was actually developed initially um, by someone working in the financial uh, domain, uh, and it's very good to for accessing and manipulating tabular data, so two-dimensional data, so the kind of data that typically you get when you open a CSV file or an Excel file, right? Um, it allows you to handle labels along axis, so column names and row indexes, indexes, and it's got a load of um, uh, input-output functions. So you can read from and write to a variety of format. Uh, it's got it introduced those, those two data structures, so series and data frames, which are a collection of, of uh, series. Basically, it's a Kind of in-memory representation of uh, of tabular of the kind of tabular data that you would have into a CSV file, and it's very good uh, for handling time series. So you've got a whole bunch of uh, functions to do resampling, rolling windows uh, operations, um, etc. You've got a very powerful group by uh, mechanism, so you can uh, split. Um, a data frame or a series according, well, a data frame according to uh, different um, uh, unique categories within your columns, apply some kind of transformation to those different groups, and then combine, um, uh, combine the resulting um, uh, information together. Uh, you've got very high level, uh, easy to use plotting functions, and you've got basic um, summary statistic functions, so calculating you can calculate quantiles or etc. easily. And then there's XRA. Uh, so XRA is uh, basically an extension. You can think about it as an ex extension of Panda uh, to multi-dimensional data. And that's very, very handy uh, in the climate domain because we are dealing with multi-dimensional data sets. So Typically, the data sets that we are dealing with are varying along a time dimension, um, a spatial dimension, so latitude, longitude, um, levels in the atmosphere or depth in the ocean. Uh, and um, XRA provides you with a, a way to represent this kind of multi-dimensional labeled arrays uh, in memory. And you can interact very easily uh, with this kind of data structure. So XRA data arrays and XRA data sets, which are basically a collection of uh, XRA data arrays. And the uh, very interesting thing about uh, XRA is that uh, it was developed um, uh, with the explicit goal to kind of copy um, the API, the application programmer interface of Panda. So basically, if you learn Pandas, you will, um, you will find uh, XRA very familiar because they kept uh, uh, very similar function and method names, et cetera. And uh, uh, again, one thing about XRA is that it, that's very interesting, especially in the climate and ocean sciences that it handles NetCDF files very easily. So NetCDF file is kind of like the standard data format for holding, especially gridded 
climate and ocean data sets. Um, and it supports um, multiple files that I said, you're going to see examples of that uh, network protocols such as OpenDAP, so you can actually access um, uh, data sets uh, over the network, so you don't have to download the data um, uh, prior to analyzing it. So again, we're going to see a few examples on, on how to do that with XRA. Um, it uses Dask, uh, so again, uh, we don't have the time to go into the all the details, but Dask um, is um, a separate library uh, that allows uh, you to handle data sets that are too large to fit in memory. So let's say, for example, if you've got a um, laptop with uh, 16 gigabytes of um, random access memory, RAM, and you've got a, a data set uh, which is uh, uh, 50 gigabytes, you cannot load all the data in memory and perform the operations on your laptop, right? Uh, the, the, uh, your RAM is too small to uh, load all the data in memory. Dask will basically um, uh, chunk the data uh, into uh, different parts and uh, will handle uh, the, uh, uh, the, the compute on uh, the different parts of uh, the data set that's sitting on disk and then put it back together at the end. So um, you're able to analyze using Dask um, uh, data sets that are too large to fit in, uh, in memory. And um, I'm basically using that all the time. Uh, so for convenience, I've got a laptop uh, and, uh, and it, 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 I don't have to worry too much about the size of the data sets that I'm, uh, that I'm analyzing. I just have to be a bit clever about how to specify the chunks, etc. But it's extremely convenient um, uh, for climate data, which is often relatively large. And there's a load of um, specialized libraries that have been built on, on top of XRA. Uh, so, and if you want to have a look at that, you can go to this uh, URL and uh, uh, the ones that are particularly uh, interesting, for example, are um, region mask, uh, which is a library built on top of XRA that allows you to use uh, shape files to do extraction uh, from gridded climate data sets. Right? Um, so you can have a look at the, you know, kind of like the XRA uh, ecosystem of uh, of packages on this uh, at this URL. Okay, and uh, before I go there, um, and XRA is one of the foundational foundational package of um, Pangeo. So I just alluded to to that earlier, and Pangeo is a community of um, software developers, basically, that's dedicated to build and organize um, and promote tools for big data geoscience. Uh, so um, the, the developers of uh, um, the Pangeo initiative are typically people coming from the atmospheric sciences, the ocean sciences, etc. And um, uh, the idea is to really build a community um, around those tools, so Dask, um, XRA, Jupyter, Jupyter Lab, etc., to make it much easier for people to access and analyze climate and ocean data or um, uh, geoscience data. So I invite you to have a bit of a look at uh, at this Pangeo uh, website because it links to a, a lot of resources that are very interesting. Um, Okay, so in on the um, repository, I gave uh, a few installation instructions. Um, so I'll go back to the slides. And the reason the reason why I'm uh, pointing towards those specific um, uh, scientific Python dis distributions, so Anaconda and uh, Mamba Forge, is that um, creating a Python scientific development environment. So install, installing Python and all those different libraries and packages, uh, especially if you want some kind of domain specific uh, packages uh, can be very challenging. Um, so again, there are multiple 
packages available in the scientific um, uh, Python domain. Uh, some of them have non-Python dependencies, so they actually depend on code developed in other programming languages, such as C, C++, and Fortran. Uh, and it can become very quickly a, a nightmare to uh, build basically a scientific development environment from scratch, right? Um, and also, um, uh, there are some issues arising from, for example, the potential need for you to test the latest version of a package, uh, but you also have some you know, operational code that you don't want to modify. Um, and you've got also issues around potentially conflicting dependencies of uh, packages or different versions of the packages, etc. So in a nutshell, if you want to install Python and uh, Python scientific ecosystem on your computer, uh, whether it's a Mac, uh, Windows machine, or a Linux machine, I really strongly recommend uh, to uh, use those uh, two Python scientific distributions. So either Anaconda, so if you go to anaconda.com, um, uh, you can basically, so I'm on a Linux machine, so it automatic, automatically detects my, uh, my operating system and you can download uh, the Anaconda Python distribution, which is basically, it ships Python itself and um, all those fun national uh, libraries that I, uh, that I alluded to earlier. Uh, NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, Pandas, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's a, another one that's called Mamba, um, Mamba Forge, sorry. Uh, and uh, again, I included the link in the slides. And um, you can download the Mamba Forge distribution for, uh, for your operating system. And that's actually the one I'm using. Uh, so those two solutions to install uh, the Python scientific ecosystem on your uh, machine also provides um, provides you with um, uh, a, a package environment and package manager. So in short, um, so it's either Conda in terms of uh, in in the case of Anaconda or Mamba in the case of the Mamba Forge distribution, but they work exactly the same. And basically what uh, it allows you to do is to uh, create separate environments. So you can have different environments with different versions of packages uh, on, your, uh, on one machine, and you can switch from one environment to the other. And um, um, Conda and Mamba are also package managers. So they can allow you to, to search for and install uh, package, packages, Python packages. Uh, so again, you know, we've got only two hours together, so I, I cannot really uh, dig into um, all the details, but I like I've included all the, the links that are that are relevant. Um, so in short, if you want to have a Python uh, scientific env development environment on your machine, either use Anaconda, the Anaconda Python distribution, or the more recently the Mamba Forge. Um, uh, Python distribution. So you just have to choose uh, your operating system and you're good to go. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's it basically. And um, so on the repository, I've included uh, environment file, uh, which, which works with either Conda or Mamba. And what it does basically is that it lists uh, the channels and the packages that are used or that are that the dependencies that uh, that other packages that we are using depend on um, uh, for this workshop, right? Uh, so again, if you want to install um, uh, Anaconda or Mamba Forge on your machine and then create the environment, um, the Python environment that we are using during this workshop, um, all you have to do is to um, use those commands. So either Conda 
and create a dash f environment.yml uh, if you've downloaded Anaconda or member and create minus dash f environment.yml if you have downloaded the member forge uh, Python distribution, right? And um, if you do that, um, it's gonna uh, basically download all the packages, install them, and you've got, you're gonna have this, uh, this environment called climate uh, data uh, that you can then activate using either um, Conda activate climate data or Mamba activate uh, climate data. So again, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm kind of breezing through all the stuff uh, very quickly, but uh, we've got only uh, only two hours. Um, so again, I invite you. So the, the slides that I'm presenting are in the slides folder into the repository. Uh, so I invite you to uh, to have a look at the, the links, the various links that I've included. Uh, okay, are there any questions so far? Am I going too fast or too slow? No. Um, all right, so I'm gonna close that. And then, um, so currently, uh, so I've got uh, the, basically the, the, a copy of uh, this particular uh, repository. And um, so I'm going into the notebook folder. I'm gonna activate the climate data environment and then I'm gonna launch uh, Jupyter Lab. So if you do that, you should have something that looks like that, right? So Jupyter Lab is a, a development environment that runs into your browser. And um, uh, that allows you to um, display and interact with uh, Jupyter Notebooks. So um, well, that's what I'm gonna do is to give you a very brief overview first of um, Jupyter Notebooks. So should I make the font larger or is that all right? Uh, it's, it's clear. It's clear. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so very briefly, so Jupyter notebooks are uh, computational notebooks that allow you to uh, weave to together code, images, um, figures, uh, outputs, um, videos, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and that are really widely used um, uh, in, especially in the, the scientific community. Uh, and the reason why it's widely used is instead of having, um, you know, your code in one file and your figures in a separate folder and your comments or, um, you know, some uh, your, the analysis, for example, of your figures or comments on the, the, the meaning and uh, uh, the significance of, uh, of your results in separate files, you can weave it all together. Right, um, uh, so uh, it's it's extremely useful for yourself first to keep track of uh, what you're doing, and also for others because that um, that makes it very easy to share um, the your computational thinking and the results of your analysis with uh, with other people. Um, so this is a Jupyter notebook currently that I've opened. And you can see that it's uh, basically made of different uh, cells. And those cells can contain uh, different types of uh, information that can be code, uh, that can be images. Uh, here, for example, I've got um, an image of my console, uh, of, uh, of a terminal console. 
um, that can be uh, figures uh, generated by the by the Python code uh, entered into uh, one of the code cells, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so if you don't have um, the Jupyter notebook. Um, Um, you have the standard Python interpreter. So if you type Python, uh, you get something like that in the terminal. Um, uh, so again, Python is a scripting language. So you've got the interpreter. I can type some comments. So for example, two plus two, and it's gonna return back the results, right? Um, so the, the Python interpreter itself, the, cons the Python console itself is, is very limited in terms of, um, interactivity and what you can display, for example, um, if, uh, if you want to plot a figure, you can call the code into uh, the Python console, but you're going to have to save the figure separately, right? It's not going to be displayed uh, in the Python console. So I'm going to quit. Um, you've got also IPython, which is um, interactive Python, which is kind of like a step up from the standard Python console, um, but it's still relatively uh, limited. So in in 2005, um, uh, people have started working onto the Jupyter notebook um, uh, based on uh, some web technologies that allow you to um, um, interact with uh, with the Python interpreter uh, in the, these notebooks that are running basically uh, in your browser. Uh, so we've just seen that. So I'm just breezing through some of the code. Um, so if you want to have a better understanding of uh, what is a IPython notebook, you can go to this, uh, this URL. Um, and um, so, as I was alluding to uh, very briefly, um, a notebook behaves like an interactive notebook, right? Like, like you would have like a notebook on the side of your desk and you would write down some, uh, uh, some comments and uh, some code and maybe include some, uh, some uh, figures uh, that you printed while well, the, the uh, IPython or Jupyter Notebook allows you to do that um, in your browser. Uh, so you can, with Python code outputs, figures, etc., etc., And it's structured into executable cells into which you can run Python code. Um, it's got also a very sophisticated, sophisticated tab completion and help system. And um, you've got all those numerous extensions that um, allow you to uh, for example, list um, files that are on your uh, hard drive, um, load files from uh, from your drive, from your hard drive, or even from uh, from uh, URLs. Um, uh, include images, uh, um, either local images or uh, from URLs in your notebook, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So basically, you've got one document. Um, uh, with which you can interact that um, uh, keeps track of, uh, of everything uh, you might think of, right? Uh, and then again, you can export a notebook in a variety of formats, so including HTML, which means that you can send it to someone else and they can have a look at, the, at the, both your code, the outputs, your comments, and the figures all in one uh, document. Uh, yeah, so there was um, recently an article, not really, not really recently, but uh, I don't know why it's not working. Recently, there was an article in Nature on um, on interactive notebooks. So there are other notebooks. Um, the Jupyter notebook is not the only kind of notebook around, but that's certainly one of the one of the most uh, uh, the more most popular. Uh, so again, um, yes, some some hints about how to actually interact with uh, with the Jupyter notebook. 
so shift enter allows you to uh, execute a code cell. Uh, so that's what I did just now. Um, so for example, this is Python code. So this Python code defines a very small function that takes uh, a number and then squares it. Um, so if I uh, type shift enter, it basically um, uh, executes the code. Uh, right now, this code is just basically defining that function. And in the next cell, I can type shift enter again, and it's going to um, uh, send you the result of, uh, of this little function, um, which is for right. And if I want to change that, I can go back so I can navigate in the cells. So I can go back to the cell, the code cell, where I called that function that I defined earlier. And I can change that to the, change the argument of that function to before, and then it will update the result, right? So you can hopefully start to see how um, those Jupyter notebooks can, uh, can be useful. You can have the code, the outputs of the code, uh, in one uh, document. Uh, so the notebook also has um, sophisticated uh, help and tab completion system. So if I, so I add this function, square that. Um, if I start typing in a code cell SQA and I type tab, it will um, try basically to complete uh, my command. If I um, append a question mark after um, an object, uh, it will basically um, return um, the help for that particular object or that particular function. Uh, so for example, here, I am importing uh, the random function, which is part of the NumPy package. Again, NumPy is one of the financial library of the Python scientific ecosystem. Um, so if I can do that, and then if I call random dot rand n and I append a question mark, it will um, basically give you give me the help for that particular function. So how do I call it? What does, what does it do? What does it return, et cetera, et cetera. So all that within the Jupyter notebook. So that's obviously uh, very com convenient. So tab completion as well. So I've, I've, I've just demonstrated that, but that's another example of that. Um, uh, so basically, once you've got a Python object, and that can be anything, that can be um, that can be a specific data structure, that can be a function. Um, uh, you can use tab completion to uh, basically inspect uh, the kind of methods and attributes of uh, of this object. So in this code cell here, I'm uh, defining a list of items. Uh, so uh, the first item is a integer number. The second item is a float. So um, two points is the equivalent of two, two point zero. Sorry. Um, this is a string. This is another integer. This is a tuple, etc. It doesn't matter. Like a list can can basically. Uh, include um, arbitrary uh, item types. So um, list A is a list. And if I type list A dot, I'm going to have um, the, so, uh, the Jupyter notebook will basically provide me with the a list of the methods that are available for uh, this particular object, which is a list. Uh, so you can, for example, append uh, something to that list. So for example, I'm going to append eight and or no, the list includes the eight that I've just appended. So again, the, you know, between, between the help system, so using the, 
uh, question mark um, appended to uh, to an object and the uh, tab completion system uh, it makes it really very easy to uh, to interact with with the objects in your uh, python code and and um, uh, basically provides you with uh, a, a way to uh, get help on, uh, on, on your objects. Uh, so in Jupyter Notebooks, you can also include markdown commands. Um, so this was a code cell here. You can see, uh, so I'm pointing with, uh, with the mouse pointer that this is a code cell. So basically that's a cell that include that, um, that holds Python code, uh, which I can then execute if I type shift enter. But you can also have markdown command. Uh, so markdown is uh, is a markup language, it's a bit like HTML, and you can basically um, uh, in your Jupyter notebook uh, insert uh, markdown um, markdown language, mark, markdown mark, markup language. So you can have all these uh, kind of rich um, uh, comments inside your notebook. So you can uh, put things in itali italic or boldface. And for example, I'm going to show you how it looks like. So uh, this is how you build um, a list. This is a, uh, a number list. Um, this is how you, so if you surround uh, a word or a sentence by uh, those two stars, it, it will render it in bold. Uh, if uh, you surround it by uh, just one star, it will render it in italic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. Um, so this is a markdown cell. This is not a code cell. So it expects markdown, the markdown mark markup language. And when I type shift enter, it will not do anything. It will just render um, uh, this cell in Markdown, right? So you can have all this, uh, this fancy stuff in your Jupyter notebook. And you can insert images. So um, for example, here I've got like a local image that I insert in, uh, in a Markdown cell. So using this syntax, right? And then you can include mathematical expression as well. So uh, there's one external library, um, uh, JavaScript library that's called MathJax, uh, which allows you to, uh, to express mathematical expressions in LaTeX, uh, which is widely used uh, in, um, in the mathematical and uh, physical science community. Uh, and that will automatically format your LaTeX into um, into these uh, nice rendered equations th thanks to my math checks All right so that's actually what it uh, looks like under the hood right so if I surround uh, an expression with those two dollars here uh, basically what it expects what uh, what uh, GPT expect is uh, LaTeX language markup language and it will render this uh, nicely. Okay, and then you can um, so again very briefly uh, include images, iframes. So basically, you can include other. Uh, you can include websites, for example, in your Jupyter notebook. You can include images uh, with this image function, which is part of the IPython display module. And you can include, uh, you can embed a YouTube video, for example, in your uh, Jupyter notebook uh, or uh, a video from, uh, from Vimeo. Okay, and you can do, um, so one of the most important aspects of, uh, of the Jupyter notebook is that if you call some Python code that is generating some plot, um, if you start your Jupyter notebook with this uh, magic command, matplotlib inline, it will include the image, so the, the, the result of your plotting function directly into the Jupyter notebook. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna call matplotlib inline. And here I'm importing numpy uh, and matplotlib. And uh, so this is Python code, which is expected to uh, basically 
uh, create a figure, and this figure is going to be inserted uh, in my Jupyter notebook directly. And I'm going to uh, very quickly go over that. Uh, so there's also some magic commands that, uh, that are available. So mat matplotlib inline is, is one example of magic commands. Uh, so this is not uh, Python code per se. This is uh, basically commands that are specific to uh, the Jupyter notebook. Uh, so you can uh, so you actually like, can list all the available uh, magic commands that they either work for a single line or for an entire code, code cell. Uh, so for example, you've got the who's command, magic command that basically will um, list and also you know kind of format uh, the different variables that are currently in memory. Um, uh, in your current um, Python session. You can write the content uh, to a file. Uh, so I don't know what I did, I forgot to, uh, sorry, so I'm just deleting that. Uh, you can load, uh, so here yeah, there's this load um, magic command that expects basically a Python file or actually any kind of file. And that will basically take the content of that file and uh, in, um, insert it into the, the current cell. So for example, here, I am taking this uh, particular Python code uh, from the matplotlib um, documentation, right? So once this is loaded, I can then execute the content of this cell. Again, I just type shift enter and it will display the result of, uh, of this code, which is in, in this case, uh, a figure, right? And you can interact with the operating system. Um, so I'm on a Linux machine on, a, on Linux, you've got this ls command, which basically lists the files in your current directory, in your current folder. Um, and I can basically, if I uh, prepend um, a command with uh, exclamation mark, what, it what the Jupyter, will, Jupyter notebook will do is that it basically, instead of sending that command to uh, the Python interpreter, it will send it to your operating system. And, um, and therefore, in this case, it's just going to return the list of files that are currently in my, um, in my current folder. And you can actually uh, return that uh, into uh, variables. Um, and, uh, and then you've got the sub process. Well, I'm just gonna go quickly over that, right? Uh, I'm gonna pass that. Uh, uh, one thing that could be useful is um, that you can export your notebook in other formats. Um, so, uh, a notebook is a file. Notebook is a file format, and that's actually just a JSON file. So that, that's uh, that's actually a text file, which uh, contains some uh, specific metadata information for each cell in the notebook. It tells you uh, whether that's a code cell, a markdown cell, um, an output, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you can you can basically take your notebook and export it into a self-contained HTML file. Um, uh, and you can do that by running the Jupyter NB convert uh, command. Um, so again, I can, cannot go into the details. You've got different options um, uh, you, and you've got different formats uh, to which you can convert your Jupyter notebook. Here, I'm just giving you an example of uh, converting this particular notebook. So Jupyter notebooks.ipynb. So the one I'm, I'm currently running into an HTML file. Uh, so I'm calling, so again, with the uh, exclamation mark uh, prepended to that command, which means that it's gonna send that to my operating system. It's gonna convert this notebook to HTML. So now if I go there and if I refresh, I should have a Jupyter notebooks.html file. Um, which I can then 
open in the browser. And basically that's my entire notebook rendered in HTML, which I can then send to, to a colleague, for example, uh, who doesn't have Jupyter or who doesn't uh, use Python, but at least they can, they can see what I did and they can see both my code, the figures, my comments, etc. So that's yeah, pretty convenient um, if you want to share uh, Jupyter notebooks. Uh, with other people. You just convert them into HTML and then send the resulting HTML file. Right. Um, so again, um, Jupyter notebooks are really, really widely used uh, as a development environment. And one of the real, really nice thing about uh, Jupyter notebooks is that you've got everything together in one document, your code, your figures, your comments, and, and some images, if you want to include some images, even some videos, etc. Right. Um, so I'm going to try to go quickly, you know, it's um, so all the other notebook, all, all the other documents here, the other files um, in the repositories are also Jupyter notebooks. Right? Uh, so I just want to demonstrate you maybe. So maybe one. I'm going to start with the the one on the reanalysis. Um, so again, I was uh, so I briefly mentioned that um, reanalysis systems are basically um, data assimilation uh, projects that. Uh, use numerical weather prediction models, so numerical models of the climate, uh, and uh, that ingest uh, observational data, so going back in the past, so everything from station data to satellite remote sensing data to radio sounds to ship-based measurements, etc. And uh, all this data uh, is uh, ingested in and assimilated into those, um, uh, those numerical uh, models and they, the outputs are dynamically consistent, gridded, um, and uh, um, potentially available for a wide variety of, uh, of variables. <clears throat> so in this notebook, I'm going to show you how to um, how to access um, both the NCEP NCAR reanalysis, so it's kind of like the legacy uh, earliest uh, early generation reanalysis system, as well as the ERA-5 um, reanalysis system, which is uh, kind of the latest state-of-the-art uh, reanalysis system. Uh, so in this, so this is a Jupyter notebook, so those are code cells. So if I type shift enter, um, uh, Jupyter will send uh, this command to um, to uh, the Jupyter kernel to, to the uh, Python uh, interpreter and return the results in the in the notebook. So what I'm doing here is just setting up some uh, some parameters, um, uh, importing a variety of uh, packages. So again, XRA is um, the one that allows to read and write NetCDF and manipulate multidimensional labeled arrays. Uh, Cartopy will allow you to um, create nice uh, geographical maps. And then you've got, so I'm just going to remove, uh, I'm just going to leave those, but it's so I'm not using them. Uh, and then NumPy and Pandas. All right. Um, so the monthly and set NCAR reanalysis, so the, the, the NCEP reanalysis, NCEP1, uh, you can find it here. So if you go to this URL, um, you've got a bunch of directories, and those directories correspond to the type of data that, uh, that you can uh, download or access. So uh, you've got data on pressure levels in the atmosphere. Um, spectral and sigma that's i'm not going to get into that you've got uh, data on surface level um, so for example you've got the topography used in the model you've got uh, the surface air temperature 
uh, etc etc so they are organized by um, roughly the dimensions along which they, the the particular variables vary um, so if i go to the surface into the surface folder you've got all those different files right um, so all the ones that contain the LTM uh, in the file name are basically long-term means, they are climatologies, uh, and then um, MON.mean, they are monthly means, uh, for, for X day are four times daily data sets, um, uh, day, uh, .ltm, so they are the daily climatologies, the daily long-term means, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and you've got a, a large number of files. So all those uh, different files correspond to different variables at, uh, so all, are, all at the surface, but different variables, um, either long-term means, so climatologies, um, uh, four times daily, daily or monthly aggregated uh, variables. So all that is you know, available for free. You, can, you don't have to, uh, you don't even have to register, that's all available from the, the, the PSL uh, website. So I, I can, let's say for example, I want the two meter air temperature, which is this one, air.mon.min.nc. So I want a monthly uh, two meters air temperature. So again, around the whole globe. Um, so I can um, type the URL. So URL. URL now is basically a string that contains the, the, the URL for that particular data set. So if I try to open it directly with uh, XRA, so I've previously imported XRA as XR, so that's just a shortcut. Uh, and I'm trying to use the open data set function to try to open this URL, it won't work. Um, because here, basically, what uh, this website uh, allow, um, expects you to do is to download the data, right? So if I click on one of the links here, it will automatically open the, the download window, and then I can uh, download it on my hard drive. But I don't want to do that. I want to access it over the network, so I don't have to download the data um, a priori. Uh, so this doesn't work. Um, and what you have to do is to use this syntax where you basically first create a connection to that uh, URL using the request uh, package. And then you have to um, use this, uh, this IO package uh, to specify that um, the content uh, of that request is going to be a binary file. So I, I cannot go into the details, but I'm just giving you that as a kind of a, a kind, of, kind of a tip uh, in a case where you've got a NetCDF file uh, that is available at a specific URL and you, so either through HTTP or HTTPS, and you want to access it over the network. So you don't want to have to download the data um, prior to the analysis. Um, uh, it's usually what you're going to have to do is to uh, use both request and IO uh, to access the resource and basically tell, um, uh, tell Python that it's a binary file. So if I do that now and I return the, the content, uh, I return the result of this uh, command uh, into this dset object. So it's going to take a little while. <laughs> so I have a question. Yes. So with this um, sort of shortcut, I suppose to get data from uh, yeah. web presence, um, could you have multiple of them? So say, for example, I'm trying to develop a composite indicator and I want multiple sources being fed into that yeah. one indicator. Can I do that on multiple lines of code with the IO? Um, yeah, so it depends. So um, it depends what you mean by multiple sources. So if you've got uh, 
multiple disparate sources. Yes. Right. So um, what you're going to have to do is that you are you're going to have to uh, create a list of those URLs yeah. and return and for it you're going to loop over each URL. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to have to return the result of um, uh, the call to this uh, you know, open data set. So accessing the, the, the resource uh, through the network um, to a different variable. So one way, one way that you could do that, so for example, is to create a, a, a dictionary, which is basically a, a, a set of, uh, of keys associated with a value. And then you can associate each key with one of those data sets. The, the example that I'm going to give is, is a bit specific is when you've got a data set uh, which is split over multiple files. Um, but that's the same data set. So for example, so, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to run through that code. Because I'm gonna go to I'm gonna go through the, the the special case of accessing multiple files that I said, and that might actually help you uh, with uh, with what you've got in mind. So uh, so if I carry on like this data set here, mm -hmm. uh, this data set object, if I if I just display it, so if I type um, shift enter it will give me a rich representation of how the data is organized, right? Yeah. So in this case, so that's monthly data starting in January, 1948, mm -hmm. ending in April, 2022. Um, it, uh, it's available globally from you know, 90 degrees north to 90 degrees south. So the convention in climate data is the southernmost, the southern latitudes. So the, the latitudes in the southern hemisphere are negative, right? That's just a convention. Um, and then available from uh, zero degrees of longitude. So the, the, uh, the Greenwich Meridian to uh, 357.5 degrees. So the resolution of this data set, so the, the step in latitude and longitude is 2.5 degree, right? That's relatively coarse resolution data set, but that's, that was easy uh, because that doesn't take uh, ages to, uh, to load. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so this is an XRA data set, right? And it gives you all the information. So basically that's a kind of in-memory representation of a NetCDF file. You've got the data and you've got the metadata mm -hmm. that gives you all the information about how the data um, so it's along which dimension the data varies and all the labels along those dimensions. So the labels in that case are latitudes, longitudes, and time, right? right. And the data set varies um, across those three dimensions. So that's a three dimensional data set. But you can have, uh, for example, if I selected um, um, variables of our pressure levels, you would have four dimensions. You would have uh, time, latitude, longitude, and levels. Mm -hmm. right. uh, and if you, um, so that's very convenient. Uh, and again, this is possible because I'm using a Jupyter notebook. This is HTML under the hood. Uh, and if I, for example, click on this little um, show hide attribute icon, it will give me some, um, it will basically display all the attributes that are attached to this particular variable. Okay, this variable here is the latitude. So it tells me that the units um, is degrees north, right? Uh, the range of the, this variable goes from 90 to minus 90. And there's, you know, additional, potentially additional attributes attached to each variable, right? So I can choose to um, display. Uh, for example, what's, what are the attributes of the air variable? That's my, actually my data, right? So that's the surface air temperature, monthly mean air temperature. Okay, so at sigma level 0 0.995, that's basically uh, approximately two meters above the surface. Right? And, um, and it will give me all this kind of information, right? the units, uh, the description, the level description, etc., cetera, et cetera. And, and you can have it you know, arbitrary number of attributes attached to each variable. Uh, so that's kind of the power of XRA and uh, the Jupyter notebook is that it really allows you to inspect your data sets, right? 
okay, so I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna carry on. So I'm closing this data set. So that's always a very good, um, uh, good tip is to, uh, when you open a resource, you close it. So an XRA data set, you close it once you're done with it, right? So I'm just calling this close method. Um, so now I had to use this kind of, you know, complicated syntax to access this data set that was available um, just on the web, right? Through HTTP or HTTPS in that case. So now uh, a lot of institutions uh, run um, what are called threads servers, which basically make available those resources um, uh, using a protocol that's a network protocol that's called OpenDAP, right? And what that means is that you don't, have, it means that you don't basically have to worry about using requests and specifying that uh, the, the data is in binary. The, uh, the server uh, basically um, provides you, provides the client to uh, all this, with all this information. And one of the nice thing as well is that you can actually um, do extractions or um, um, uh, slice and dice the data uh, through the thread server. So in short, the PSL so um, is also running a thread server and there's a catalog that you can browse where you've got all those data sets available. So again, so the one that we are going to see is the NCEP reanalysis um, and specifically the derived reanalysis, which means basically they are the um, sorry, they are, uh, contain all the monthly means, right? Um, but you've got all those different data sets that are available um, through this uh, thread server. Um, so, for example, if, you, if you're after sea surface temperature, the NOAA has got, uh, so the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration in the US um, has got some data sets, for example, the, the ERSST uh, data set, uh, the OISST, optimally interpolated sea surface temperature, etc., etc. So, you know, a good source of, of data. You've got also uh, the 20th century analysis, which basically is an uh, is a, a longer analysis that goes back to the, the early to the late uh, 19th century, right? So um, this URL is in the reanalysis notebook because uh, there's a lot of uh, data that you know you might be interested in. So in this case, you browse the catalog, and um, again, I want the surface air temperature. So it's contained into the uh, reanalysis derived folder. Uh, so I get the URL. So I return that URL into that uh, URL variable, which is basically just, just a string with, with the URL. And then I can open it directly uh, using XRA. I don't have to do this complicated request, etc. So there you go. And it's pretty fast. And you've got the exact same thing, right? So that's the exact same data set. It's just available via OpenDAP uh, and it's served uh, by this uh, thread server. So I don't have to worry about, about anything. Uh, so I'm closing that. All right, so maybe that's, that's getting close to kind of your question. What if I've got a data set that is split between multiple files? So for example, a, a typical case is where you've got a, a large data set of let's say daily um, variables. And um, uh, typically you don't have one file with all this, this data. Um, you've got one file per year, right? Uh, and, but you want, instead of having to download this data or instead of, instead of having to uh, loop over uh, a list of uh, files and return that into a dictionary or whatever, uh, you can directly uh, open a multiple multiple files that are set uh, using XRA. So in this case, um, so I want the um, daily surface air temperature. Again, that's the same as sigma 
uh, uh, 0.995, um, which is available here. And you can see you've got all these files here, right? One per year. But that's one data set. I just want to open it as if it was just one file. I don't want, I don't want to have to deal with the with the fact that it's uh, split across multiple files. Um, so if you look again at that um, that URL here uh, in the catalog, you can see that the, each file has the, exactly the same pattern, right? The only thing that changes is the year. So what I can do, oops, what I can do is so I'm just giving an example of one file here just to see what's con what the content of that file here is so that's for one year year 2000 that's a leap year I've got 366 days right so that's just for one year um, so what I'm going to do if I want to open this data set which is again split across multiple files all I have to do is to create a list of URLs. And I'm using what's called a list comprehension syntax in uh, Python to do that. So what I do now, and I, I just select it just for the sake of, of uh, interest, like not spending too much time on that. I just selected a few files, um, a range of years, right? From 2010 to 2021. Uh, so I've got a list of files and I can use the open multiple file data set um, to open this as if it was one file. Okay, so that's taking a little bit of time because those are, that's daily data. So for it's not gonna take too much time. Maybe there's a problem with the thread server. Okay, as usual with a demonstration, there seems to be some issue, but usually that works. <laughs> um, but that's basically the, the, the syntax. Okay, I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, yeah, so it's loaded. Usually that doesn't take that much time. So now, <clears throat> right, I've got one data set and uh, 4,018 time steps now for 4,018 times running from the 1st of January, 2010 to the 31st of December, uh, 2020. Right, and I can, uh, so again, XRS got do this plot um, uh, function method, sorry. So if I call that um, on, and I'm just selecting one time step. I've got like a, a nice, very, well, at least a, uh, a, a simple, but self-describing map, right? I've got the name and the labeled, and the labels along the um, latitude and longitude dimensions. And I've got actually the, uh, the name of the variable here and the time uh, automatically. So I didn't have to specify anything because um, uh, again that's the, the power of uh, of XRA is that all the metadata is attached to the to the data itself so if you call it a plot function basically the plot function will try to do its best to display things uh, nicely so this, this is in uh, Kelvin we can convert to Celsius easily with um, with this command and those are the values in Celsius. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of running a bit late, so I'm just gonna um, quickly go ahead. So again, the, you know, all the notebooks uh, are available on the, on the repository, so you guys can, can have a look at that uh, at your leisure. So here I'm um, accessing so another very good source of data climate data is the asia pacific data research center 
to the EAG APDRC has got a whole bunch of data for a whole bunch of domains, so ocean, atmosphere, etc. And it does include a subset of the ERA5 uh, reanalysis. <clears throat> so ERA5, so and you've got the open DAP. So again, that's what I've demonstrated just now, like the open DAP protocol, which allows you to access resources over the network without having to uh, worry about um, anything, the data format, etc. Uh, and you've got a subset of the uh, ERA5 data set uh, at this URL. Uh, so for example, you've got the monthly um, surface level ERA5 um, uh, variable, some of the variables uh, available. Uh, so here I'm specifying the URL, um, which is, so if you go there, basically you've got the info and you click on the, uh, sorry, and you um, use this URL here. Okay, that's the opened up URL, which you pass to XRA. And you've got the ERA5 reanalysis. So this reanalysis is much higher res spatial resolution than NSEP. You can see um, 721 uh, latitude. Uh, 1,440 longitude, um, so that's a quarter of a degree, not 2.5 degrees. So very nice, very nice data set. Uh, and then, uh, I'm just gonna go through the that. I'm just gonna run everything. I just wanna wanna show you quickly. It's going to take a little while. So those are warning messages related to the um, uh, to the date format, but that's not that's not uh, important. Uh, yeah. So, Cartopi. So if you look, Cartopi Python. Uh, is basically a package that allows you to create um, maps, geographical maps. So that's just a few examples of, uh, of uh, using Cartopie uh, to display data on the map. Right. So you have got gridded era five temperature at, uh, at a given level in the atmosphere. And I can you know, choose, the, um, uh, choose the projection uh, that I can that I, uh, I'm displaying the data on, so that's very very convenient. And you've got a whole bunch of uh, different uh, projections that are available. Okay, so in short, this notebook here. So I'm going to actually rerun all cell, and I'm going to push the um, the rendered notebook to the Jupyter to the repository, the GitHub repository. But this notebook here reanalyzes. Um, is basically a brief overview of uh, how to access um, reanalysis, so especially NCEP and ERA5 uh, over the network. So you don't have to download the data and, and um, onto your local hard drive. You can access those resources directly over the network. Uh, one thing that I might want to quickly show because we've got relatively limited time, is to um, access SEMIP6 data. So again, SEMIP6, that's the latest iteration of the SEMIP project, uh, coupled model intercomparison inter project, uh, the one that's informed the uh, uh, working group one of the APCC, IPCC. And um, in short, that, that is really a pain to access it through the Earth System Grid uh, Federation. Uh, you have to download the data. That's potentially a lot of data. Uh, so um, one very convenient way, if you want to access uh, SEMIP6 data, is to have a look at um, the data that's on the Google Cloud. Um, so again, that's a subset of all the SEMIP6 experiments, uh, but that's, that's super convenient. And uh, we can do that using um, uh, a library that's called Intake. 
um, so that's that's included into the environment that I created. And intake is a is a basically a package for finding, uh, investigating, so interrogating and and loading uh, data, uh, especially data that is available on uh, cloud storage platforms. And um, there's a plugin that's called Intake ESM, uh, Earth System Model, which is a package that that, prov that provides the interface to searching and loading Earth system model data archives specifically, such as synopsics. Um, and then, um, so what you have to do is to um, open what's called a data store. So this is the URL for all the synopsics data that is available on the Google Cloud. Uh, so that's a JSON file. Um, so you open this data store. And this data store is not a data set. That's basically a reference to all those data sets that are available on the Google Clouds. Um, and um, so the, the, the nomenclature here is a bit complicated, but you've got uh, the activity ID correspond to um, the different activities under the CMIP6 project institution that's the institution. So that can be, for example, the CSRO in, the, in Australia, um, NCEP in the US, etc. Um, the source ID is the actual model. Um, you've got experiment ID, member ID, table ID, etc. So I'm going to just show you very quickly um, what it looks like. So first of all, the, uh, the type of this object here called, that's not a Data set per se, there's no data attached to it. It's just a, basically a data store or a reference to, uh, to uh, actual data sets. And um, there's actually a data frame which gives you all the, uh, all the information. So again, activity, that's the activity, the institution, that's the generated institution, the source ID is the actual model, the general circulation model that, uh, that was used. Uh, table ID gives you the, um, the resolution, the temporal resolution. So for example, a month uh, is monthly data. And you've got here the Z, the Z store is basically where the data resides on the uh, Google Cloud. Um, and so you've got yeah, all those different columns that I mentioned. <clears throat> so for example, I want to list, um, so experiment ID, is it's huge, right? So I just want to list uh, the ones that contain uh, the SSP uh, uh, substring. So all the uh, shared uh, socioeconomic pathways uh, experiments. So there are all those. Uh, so there's a bunch of them. Some of them are very specific. The usual one, are, for example, um, SSP 2.245, uh, 585, 370, 119, etc. 126. So the kind of like you know the ones with three digits are the are the common ones. Um, so I want the two ones. Uh, so I want the historical first for, first of all. So that's basically experiment um, uh, running over the historical period with the observed um, uh, greenhouse gases concentrations. And then you've got uh, the scenarios in the future from from actually 2015 onwards. To, uh, to 2100, uh, corresponding to the uh, SSP 245 and uh, 585. So I'm creating the list of basically that, you know, the experiments ID that I want. So historical, historical, not historical, 245 and 585. And I build a query, which is a little dictionary. Um, so the first one is the, the list of experiments I want. Uh, I want only monthly uh, values, tasks is um, uh, uh, temperature at the surface, and the member ID is just to, uh, to make sure it's all coming from the, from the same member. And then I'm searching um, this data store um, for all the data sets that correspond to my query. All right, and I've got all that, right? So those are all the GCM uh, for which you've got um, both the, I mean, for, for which you've got the historical 
SSP245 and SSP885 uh, experiments for um, surface temperature, uh, monthly surface temperature, right? So those are all the models that are available currently on the Google Cloud. So that's a lot, right? So that's actually 34 models. Uh, so for the sake of illustration, and I'm just gonna blaze through that, uh, I'll choose the, the Australian model, the Access um, CM2 model. Okay, so I'm just gonna update my query. So now my query uh, also has um, so I want to specify the source ID being access-cm2. Um, so same thing, I'm going to search, and I've got the result of this search is basically those three data stores here um, with uh, SSP245, historical SSP585. So yeah, it's monthly surface air temperature. And those are actually in Z-store where the data is actually residing. Um, so I'm not gonna get into the detail, but those, uh, this data is not in NetCF, uh, it's in um, uh, a cloud optimized uh, file format called ZAR, which uh, for all intent, intent and purpose basically um, uh, is similar to NetCF, right? So once you, once you load the data, you not only have the data, you also have the metadata again, uh, the dimensions along which the data varies, uh, the coordinates along those dimensions, etc. Uh, so I'm gonna use this data frame here. I'm just gonna query uh, respectively um, the location for the historical experiment, SSP245 and SSP585, right? So that's, um, returns me the URL. So that's on the Google Cloud, okay? So that's not HTTPS. Um, so that's for historical, that's for SSP245, and that's for SSP2585. And then I can open the data set with XRA, and you can see it's not open NetC, open data set, that's open ZAR. And then you've got this uh, specific uh, um, syntax to basically open um, the location on the Google uh, cloud file storage. So it might take a little while. <coughs> there we go. So actually, it's going to display it in HTML. So there we go. You've got here um, the data set associated with the historical experiment on the access. CM2 model, um, available. so for surface air temperature, monthly surface air temperature, right? Uh, so that's going from 1850 to uh, December, so uh, January 1850 to uh, December uh, 2014, right? So you can do the same. So I'm just, gonna, I've got a little function just to clean up some stuff here, the, the bounds the time bounds, et cetera, which are usually getting in the way of uh, some aggregation operation. So here yeah, that looks a bit better, but that's the same data set, right? And I'm doing the same for SSP245 and SSP585. So for some reason here, there are some warning related to the, the coding of the time variable, but I'm not worried about that. Um, Yeah, so I'm just gonna run that, all that. What I'm doing is basically, that might take five minutes. I'm calculating now um, area weighted um, average of the global mean temperature anomalies uh, for the historical experiment on access S. So it is running, but again, that's, that's, that's a very large data set. And um, so one thing that I didn't mention as well is that um, the data set is actually not loaded on memory, in memory. That's what I was mentioning before. Uh, it uses Dask under the hood. And uh, what it means is that uh, basically um, 
when I do all these things, so I um, uh, basically create a climatology and I remove the climatology from the raw data to obtain anomalies. And then I weight uh, the resulting anomalies by the um, uh, cosine of the, of the latitude. Um, uh, you know, to, to account for the, the different area represented by uh, grid points at the pole versus grid points at the equator. Um, and then I calculate the mean, so the global mean over the longitude and latitude, all that is uh, a lot of operations basically that are chained together and um, they are only executed once I call compute. And what Dask is going to do is basically going to uh, um, distribute uh, the computation over chunks of the data, uh, um, so which is currently not loaded in memory, basically. Um, uh, so that's that's the mechanism by which you can uh, analyze uh, very large data sets uh, that are basically too large to uh, uh, to fit into the the memory of your machine. Um, so it might take a might take me five minutes, take five minutes to, uh, to do that. Um, and then uh, at the end, you're going to have a, a plot, like a time series of the area weighted um, uh, temperature, global temperature anomalies from the, this um, uh, CMIPSIX experiment. So the historical experiment on the access uh, CM2 uh, general circulation model. Uh, and if you want actually to, so I gave another example on calculating area weighted uh, global temperature anomalies, but using the NCEP reanalysis uh, in this notebook, global average temp uh, NCEP. So I can run it concurrently. In the meantime, because this is taking a little while, so that should be much faster. Um, so it leverages what I presented before about um, on, you know, accessing resources through the network. Um, so that's using uh, the OpenDAP protocol. Um, so I just create maps of the average temperature and the difference between two decades here. Uh, so the 2010s and the 1950s. Um, zoom in to, to look at the um, northern hemisphere. So, you know, you've got this, uh, so the, the largest um, warming is at the high latitude of the southern and especially northern hemisphere. And then I show how to calculate uh, climatology. So, um, basically the, the average of each month of our climatological period, subtract that from the original data to obtain anomalies. Yeah, I'm plotting the anomalies for December, 2021. So again, you see at the high latitude of the Northern Hemisphere for this particular month, very, very large anomalies um, exceeding 13 degrees, which is uh, completely insane. And, um, yeah, so in that notebook, I also uh, talk about um, basically the difference between weighted and unweighted anomalies because um, so the majority of the warming of the, or the strongest warming is at the high latitude of both hemisphere, but those high latitudes represent uh, each grid point is associated with a relatively small area um, uh, compared to the, the lower latitudes. So you have to weight by the area. Um, uh, to have a correct representation of the global average temperature. So that's what I'm doing here. And you've got here the difference between the weighted mean and the standard mean. Okay, if you just calculate the standard mean, you kind of exaggerate um, the global warming signal because you uh, give the same weight to grid points at the high latitudes uh, uh, as you do for grid points at the low latitudes, but they actually do not represent the same area. So if I go back to that one, still running, but it should create a plot. <clears throat> the, 
the same that's the exact the same that's the exact same mechanism that's just using a you know much larger data set in that case that's the historical um, experiment coming on, on access s coming from the simip6 archive so at some point it should finish and display plot hopefully so it's going to go all the way back to 1850 actually <coughs> so the the other notebooks that I didn't have to the time to go through. Uh, uh, so this one, pandas. Um, so I'm gonna run it, and I'm gonna also update it on update it onto the repository. Uh, is um, giving you an example of using pandas to read and. Um, read data contained into a csv file and basically do some kind of uh, some some manipulation on this data set so in that case I'm, I'm just calculating the climatological 90th percentile um, uh, so the the value um, that is exceeded only 10 10 percent of the time uh, and i'm using that to um, extract very hot months basically heat waves let's say those are not really heat waves, but they are, you know, ex extremely hot month uh, for a specific location. I think I chose Hamilton in that because I'm in Hamilton, but uh, you can choose uh, Christchurch. You've got 30 different stations. Um, and here, yeah, those are basically that's the time series of the month exceeding the uh, climatological 90th percentile. So that's a kind of good example of what you can do with pandas. And then the, the one other one is downscale um, uh, CMIP6, uh, which really gives you some pointer towards uh, data that's been coming from the CMIP6 uh, climate change scenario scenarios that have, have been downscaled and bias corrected. So all those different models, those different GCMs, um, they've got biases if you compare them to, uh, to observations. And also they are available at a relatively coarse spatial resolution. Um, so there's been a few projects. Um, so lately, because the same six data basically has been released relatively recently uh, that have applied um, uh, statistical techniques to correct the biases uh, of this model and also increase the resolution of the data set so that you can um, you know have a better idea of um, of uh, climate change trajectories um, at relatively small spatial scales like let's say over New Zealand instead of over the whole globe so this this um, uh, notebook just gives you some pointers towards um, three um, data sets that I know of uh, that hold downscaled and bias corrected, bias corrected CMIP6 uh, simulations. So let's say, uh, yeah, so I'm going back to this uh, CMIP6 in the cloud. So this is the time series of the weighted, area weighted uh, temperature anomalies uh, for the historical experiment. In, um, on access uh, CM2. And um, I think that's the, that's the end. So again, I kind of expected that, that I would not have the time to cover all the material. Uh, again, that was kind of like a you know, show and tell and high level overview of um, what climate data you can, uh, you can get, uh, how to access uh, them, so especially Reanalysis data and CMIP6 simulations. Uh, and I'm more than happy to answer any question. Um, uh, if so, if you want to send me an email after that, uh, that workshop or at any point, uh, you're, you're welcome. And I'm more, more than happy to help if I can. Okay. Thank you for your time, Mikama. And um, is there any questions? Um, So 
please join me in um, thanking Nicola for presenting today and uh, thank you for sharing so much information. Um, yeah. A bit too much probably. But... <laughs> no, I, I, I was, it was a very good overview and thank you for answering my question. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for your time. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, and thanks for being a part of our postgrad network for this year and we appreciate it. Good. No worries. And again, happy to help if uh, anyone has questions after this workshop and wants to get in touch. I'm, uh, I'm happy to do that. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Cool. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Is that all right? Yeah. And I'll stop recording. Yeah.